Next, we'll be hearing from writer and academic. He's a professor in the Department of Peace Studies at Bradford University and columnist on global security for open democracy. Paul Rogers, the screen is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Shelley. And thank you very much for inviting me here this afternoon. I really want to just uh, have an opportunity to talk a little bit more about the themes that have been so well developed by Kate and Lindsay and Tarek. Um, because so much is happening at present that I think we need to sort of stand back and get a bit of a grip on it. I want to look actually at one or two things that have happened on the other side of the Atlantic, because in a way they're quite intriguing. If you go back, what, nearly 30 years, um, Clinton, when he came in, in what, 1992, he appointed uh, as director of the Central Intelligence Agency a guy called James Woolsey. And Woolsey was asked at Senate hearings how he would describe the collapse of the old order, the Soviet Union gone. And he said, I put it this way, we've slain the dragon, but we now live, we now in, now in, well, I'm living in a jungle, we now live in a jungle inhabited by poisonous snakes. And in a sense, although you have the rise of the new so-called threats from China and Russia, that old idea is still very much with us. But interestingly, it sometimes goes wider than that. We talked a bit about the integrated review on defense development and foreign policy. Um, just about three weeks ago, um, a study was published by the US Office of the Director for National Intelligence, and that's one of the very big agencies of which you hear rather less. And the director has a particular think, mini think tank, and it produces a, a statement on global trends every four years. It's just published a new one. It's called Global Trends, subtitle, A More Contested World. The Washington Post said it's fascinating and described it as a world unsettled by the coronavirus pandemic, the ravages of climate change, which will propel mass migration, and a widening gap between what people want and governments can deliver. And when you look at the, the report, it deals with economic issues in these sorts of terms, forecasting, quotes a more fragmented trading environment, rising governmental debt, employment challenges, and increasing corporate power at the state level. It also focuses particularly on, quotes the more strained relationships between societies and their governments, as if accentuating the recent rise of diverse political populisms. Now, you don't get anything like that depth of analysis in our own review. And in many ways, at first sight, people will say, that's actually interesting. And that sort of strikes a chord. It's talking about things which don't figure much in British government thinking, which as Tarek said so clearly, is very much couched in this idea of reclaiming a kind of imperial role. You know, there's this comment, which I think is, is really there that France and Britain both have these delusions of post-imperial grandeur. And by chance, they're the two countries that both have nuclear forces, which they certainly don't remotely need. And they also have big aircraft carriers to show the flag worldwide. Now, the interesting thing is when you look at the, the American study, um, there are two things which are massively and very obviously missing. It doesn't recognize that the underlying problem for so much of this, when you're talking about the economic issues and the rest, is that you have the dominant neoliberal economic culture, which is enhancing a yet more divided and marginalized society. And that's at the root of so many of the problems we face. It is beginning to recognize some of the other elements, particularly its concentration on climate breakdown, but it doesn't see it in the wider context. And then there is the much wider issue, which again has been touched on already, that you're dealing with what, interestingly, Eisenhower popularizes a phrase all those years ago, the military industrial complex, or as some people say, the military industrial academic bureaucratic complex. And this entity, this part of national cultures, the bigger it is coincides with how large the military of a country is, but it's present to an extent in virtually every country. It's embedded in an attitude which basically sees recourse to power and the use of power is the main way forward. That in fact is almost the first thing. And as Tarek was saying, the extraordinary thing is, this is in spite of the failures. Now he's mentioned in particular Afghanistan, and we're seeing that sort of unframe almost in front of our eyes. And he mentioned the others like Yemen and, and Iraq. The most significant one, I think, for the future is actually the fourth of the failed wars, which we rarely talk about. That is the failed air war against ISIS. And remember, that was incredibly intense between 2014 and 16. It continued for another two years, and it's still going on. Last month, the Royal Air Force and the US Air Force, and I think probably French aircraft, were involved in about 130 attacks 
against ISIS units in Iraq and Syria. Now, virtually none of that was reported outside the military literature. And the point is this whole move towards remote warfare is in a sense sort of covering up what's really continuing. And I've no doubt at all that Biden will do his best to withdraw most of the troops from Afghanistan. He may well succeed fully. There will be privatized elements left, but most of the Americans will have gone. But the capability to intervene will not have gone. And essentially, if from the American perspective, things get out of hand, then there will be plenty of forces available pretty close to the country in terms of drones, strike aircraft and the rest to intervene. The American presence in Iraq numbers what probably 2000 and they're mostly in training roles. But you have planes from aircraft carriers, from bases in Kuwait, Jordan elsewhere, the British places at Kretiri in Cyprus, all able to continue the process. And it's in this kind of way that it goes on, just as France is fighting this long-term war in the Sahel. Now, ISIS was not, quotes, defeated in the conventional sense. And that kind of paramilitary movement is now almost rampant across much of the Sahel. It goes on, but it goes on in the quiet. And this, I think, is one of the most important things that we have to recognize. This is a long-term problem, and it breaks out in different ways. Now, the root of it, obviously, is coming to terms with the failed economic paradigm. The fact that while we're beginning to get to grips with climate breakdown, we have a very long way to go. And also, we have to rethink security because the military industrial complex is simply not fit for purpose. What else can you say about this at the moment? Well, one of the issues here, and it's been touched on already, the use of the, of the Union flag and the rest, is that this perception that Great Britain, or the term great, relates to a kind of imperial past <clears throat> and a kind of quasi-imperial future. That has to be, in, in a sense, reinvented and redeveloped. And there are very easy ways of doing this, and so much of it, in fact, was in Jeremy's um, Geneva speech of what three or four years ago and if you're not read that you should go back and read that because that really paints a very different picture of the kind of role a country like Britain could play. I certainly would go along with the people who are now arguing that one of the things you do as a starting point is decrease military spending in Britain by 10% a year for 10 years. With reverse compound interest it takes you down to about 40% to what you have now but you reconfigure the forces. You put far more effort into UN peacekeeping, you put far more effort away more from the military into conflict prevention in all its different forms. Where you have military forces, they're geared for two roles. They can do humanitarian work when push comes to shove very urgently, effectively, and they can do peacekeeping as well. The other roles really are incidental given the sorts of faces we need, but we, we, the forces we need in the future. As has been said, you can't nuke a virus and you can't use nuclear weapons to defeat climate breakdown. These are completely different sorts of security threats, and they're the ones that face us, the important ones. And probably more important than anything else is the critical need nationally to rethink what we mean by security. Some think tanks are doing this. Rethinkingsecurity.org, I think, is probably the best at the present time. There's a lot of very good work going on in different areas, critiquing the neoliberal economy, and critiquing and putting forward better ideas for the kind of response we have to environmental issues. In some ways, we're in a hugely important time. It's a time of change. And I love that definition of prophecy, where prophecy is said to be merely basically envisaging, uh, or almost envisaging the possible, determining the possible, thinking through the possible. Because that has to be the role for people like us, in addition to the campaigning, we have to work out what are the best ways forward and how we can adopt them. If we can do that, then we can provide a degree of something which is so missing in all of that, and that is hope. So basically, prophecy is suggesting the possible. That's one of the things that we have to do. And there's so much more, but that at least is a starter. Thanks very much, Shelley.